advocate, so I hope you all are warmer. Um, it is often difficult on conference calls to have um, you know, interaction, but I wanted to let everybody know that there is a chat option, and if you have questions or comments or things you want to put into the conversation, please um, just you know, message into the chat, and we'll be able to see that and then respond to it. And there will be time for questions, answers, conversation towards the end of the of the um, presentation. But I do hope you all will, you know, let us know what you're thinking as time goes on. So, as Allison said, I started the New Haven Diaper Bank in 2004 in my kitchen with a number of friends and family. And I started after working as a social worker doing direct service with families in their homes and in different venues in the community. And what I saw again and again in working with all of these families, all families that had children, all families that had some sort of issues going on in their lives, whether it was substance use, mental illness, homelessness, you know, different things that made life difficult. What I saw over and over again was a level of poverty that was very difficult to wrap my head around, even as um, somebody who really felt like they understood what poverty looked like, being in people's homes and seeing the, the things that people were doing without in Connecticut in, you know, the 21st century was really very, very eye-opening to me. And I learned through my clients just how difficult it was to get the things that they needed. And um, so those of you who know me well will not be surprised that I became a little bit obsessed with the issue of diapers. I became really interested in the idea that families were living on basically no income and trying to find a way to provide for the most basic um, needs of their children. So the way that I looked at it was small things impact big things and that a diaper or something so small can make a huge difference in someone's life. So I want to talk about a few things, and I hope that I'm going to piece them together in a way that makes sense to people. And please, as I said, chat, you know, put in something if you feel like there's something missing or something we really should get to. I want to talk about what poverty is, how poverty impacts child development, and then some of the realities of trying to rise out of poverty in America, how expensive and how difficult it is to be poor, some of the things that some of us don't think about, and ways that diaper bankers can use this information um, in talking about diaper need and raising awareness of the issue and potentially um, in fundraising as well. So I want to start just with this idea. It's nothing it's nothing nothing that people don't know, but it's something we don't like to talk about. So, you know, money is a big deal. You know, money matters. And research shows over and over again that giving aid, money to families increase the chances that a child will not continue to live in poverty as an adult. It's so simple. But when we look at ways to address poverty in America, most of, most of the answers don't have to do with giving people money or concrete things. So there are lots of studies that show that people um, who use, who get earned income tax credits work more hours and then pay more into taxes than people who don't. Um, there's a study by the National Bureau of Economic Research that shows that children of parents who receive SNAP benefits are more likely to achieve economic self-sufficiency as adults than their peers. You know, it's very simple things. We know that when people have what they need, they have, children have a better chance for optimal development. But 
it's something that is very difficult for us to address. So broadly speaking, sort of to, to start with, you know, why, why do we care about poverty? Um, aside from sort of what would be the, you know, obvious answers that we care about the people around us and we want people to have what they need. We now know that chronic stress in early childhood causes toxic stress. So toxic stress occurs when a child experiences strong, frequent, or prolonged adversity. And that can include physical or emotional excuse, chronic abuse, I'm sorry, chronic neglect, caregiver substance abuse, mental illness, exposure to violence, and the accumulated burdens of family economic hardship. So we know that having extended exposure to poverty is one of the things that can cause toxic stress. And it, it can be triggered by one or many sources, but it has a cumulative toll on an individual, on a child's physical and mental health, and, and it has that effect for a lifetime. And the more adverse experiences in childhood, the greater likelihood of developmental delays and health problems later in life. And those health problems can include heart disease, diabetes, substance abuse, and depression. So there are many things that impact a child's development, but what I want to be able to talk about and what I think diaper bankers are uniquely positioned to talk about is that poverty is not an afterthought. It is as significant an adverse experience as many of the others and should be addressed directly. So there are some great resources um, that some of you may use already, and if you don't, I really recommend looking at the National Center for Children in Poverty, which is where these next two um, slides come from, to look at, at so many different aspects of poverty as a risk factor. So, we know that the more time a child lives in poverty, the greater chance there is that they'll live in poverty as an adult. So the longer they live in poverty as a child, the more chance there is that they will live in poverty as an adult. It's broadly known and accepted. And the fact that we continue to allow it is something that um, I think we need to sort of think about and talk about. So one thing we know is that across the U.S., many children are affected by one or more risk factor. And chief among them is economic hardship. So this slide and the next one I just want to show you really quickly are the number of children under six experiencing economic hardship, and this was 2010, but it, it's a little bit lower now. But so about 48% of children in America are living at or below, or at low income. So that is at 200% of poverty or below. Um, and, and this is, is very interesting when you look at the number of children under six years old versus the number of children six to 17 years old. So what we know is that many more children, young children, live at or below poverty. And those children are at significant risk for all sorts of issues. Now, if you go to the National Center for Children in Poverty, they have tons of fact sheets. Um, one of the things that they have that is so useful and really can be useful to all diaper bankers is a, um, it has an interactive risk assessment, um, which is very interesting. So you can put in different risk factors and sort of see um, per, through a, a percentage um, you know, sort of what the chances 
of various difficulties for a child might be. The other thing it has that's very, very interesting is a budget calculator. And if you put in a zip code or a state and then different family characteristics, it can tell you how much it actually cost or would cost for a family in with the family structure that you put into this um, basic needs calculator um, to to live. And it's, it's really interesting because it varies a great deal from state to state, community to community, and it also um, takes into account different subsidies. So you can look at what it would cost if the family has SNAP benefits or what it would cost if the family didn't, what, how much money they need to be making if they have subsidized housing or if they don't. And, and these numbers are really useful when talking to funders and policymakers about the reality of, of life for families. So the, the question that we all struggle with every day is how do you keep your baby clean and healthy if you can't afford diapers, right? Society expects parents to keep children clean, but it doesn't fund that expectation. If you bring a dirty baby to the doctor, that doctor is required to call DCF. They're a mandated reporter. If your child goes to school dirty, again, we look at that potentially as neglect. When people see dirty children on the street, children uh, you know, whose diaper hasn't been changed, they often think of neglect. But the fact is that many families can't afford to meet the basic needs of their children. And we've turned diapers and other hygiene products into a luxury when in fact they're a necessity. And so, so the big question is why do we think about diapers and basic needs as a way to address poverty? So for me, the question is how could you not? You know, poverty shows itself in many different ways. But one of the ways that I always think about it is how much money I spend how much money I spend on hygiene products and cleaning supplies. And I will tell you, and those of you who know me well, I am not crazy about either hygiene products or cleaning supplies. I don't have tons of different shampoos. I don't have lots of different creams and things like that. Yet, I buy these things every month. Feminine hygiene products, every month. You know, depending on the age of your children, you're buying all of these different things. And the fact is, they're really expensive. And, and one of the questions that I often ask funders and policymakers to think about is, could they go a month without spending any money on hygiene products or cleaning supplies? You know, could you really not ever go down that aisle? in the supermarket. And, and if you couldn't, think about how you would rank the different things that you might buy. You know, how do you clean your house without a broom? How do you brush your teeth without a toothbrush? How do you wash your clothes without soap? How do you diaper your baby without a diaper? You know, these are such basic questions and such basic things to think about, but so many of us don't. And so diapers are really a very, very concrete way to talk to people about this. You know, so a lot of people might not want to talk about, you know, feminine hygiene products or even about deodorant or toilet paper, but diapers are a basic need for children, for babies. And almost anyone, I think, can imagine what a difficult decision it would be for a parent to have to decide to spend money on diapers or not, to leave their child in a dirty diaper all day. Because one thing 
that I believe, and I, I really have to believe in order to do this work, is that nobody has a child not planning to give that child the absolute best life they can. Everybody wants the best for their children. Nobody says, you know what, I'm going to leave my kid in a diaper all day, one diaper. Now, that, that's nobody's plan. And so one of the things that we as diaper bankers can do is help other people to see that, that it's oh. nobody's first choice to do that. So everyone, everyone on this call knows that there's no, there's no uh, assistance program to meet basic needs, Medicaid, food stamps, WIC, none of them cover diapers or any hygiene products. Now, I want to start by saying I don't think NDBN does not support the idea of trying to add diapers to WIC or SNAP benefits for a lot of reasons, not the least of which they aren't um, robust enough to support everything that they're doing now. But we know that there does need to be a way to get people what they need. And, and some of the things that are disallowed by food stamps, by SNAP, make sense. You know, pet food, um, beer, liquor, cigarettes. But soap and paper products, household supplies, and diapers and hygiene products, those are things that people need. Those are not luxuries. But because we don't see them, you know, the definition of basic needs in America doesn't include hygiene products. Um, and so we don't have people talking about the fact that these things are so necessary. So you all know, right, the federal poverty level is incredibly out of whack with what it actually costs to live in America. It's based on USDA food budgets that meet minimal nutritional standards. And it was put together in the 50s. And it has only been updated for inflation. It hasn't been updated in any other way. So the price of food has risen much more slowly than other basic needs. So in real terms, you know, dollar for dollar, comparing one to the other, food has, has gotten cheaper as housing, transportation, and other basic needs costs have increased. So it, it continues to make it harder and harder for families to be able to provide those things that their children need. Right, so the federal minimum wage is $775, $16,120 a year. It's crazy, right? Could you imagine trying to raise a family on $16,000 a year? Right now, Washington State has the highest minimum wage in the country, $947 an hour, and it's still is slightly below the federal poverty level, working 40 hours a week. One of the things we know is that many, many families who are poor and low income are working. They're working full time, they're working more than one job, and they still can't meet the needs of their family. And this is something that we also can really use as diaper bankers. The fact that working full time leaves you living below the federal poverty level is something that our supporters need to understand. Because the idea that people working a minimum wage are teenagers who are living in their parents' house is just not the case anymore. Now, there are areas where the minimum wage is going to go up, um, you know, even over $10, and it will bring, um, if you're working full-time at, at that, if you happen to be lucky enough to do that, it will be slightly above the poverty level, but that is not um, 
been accepted by any states. It's still um, localities, cities, and whatnot that are doing that. So this is sort of what I always come back to, is this myth of self-sufficiency, this idea that we're providing um, people an opportunity. You know, you hear this a lot when I'm sure each of you who has ever talked to someone about diaper banking or asked someone to help support you, they say, well, I don't want to give them a handout. You know, I just, I want you to, I want them to become self-sufficient. I want to teach them how to get what they need. So, you know, that's great. That is a great idea. But the reality is that we know how much money people living in poverty have. And we know how much it costs to live. And we know that there's a huge gap between those things. So how is it that we address this myth, myth of self-sufficiency? How do we help people who want to support families to become self-sufficient to understand that providing basic needs is one way to do that? And I would say that we need to spend money on prevention of problems in order to save money later. We know that children thrive when they're well cared for. And babies need to have their diapers changed when they're wet or dirty, not when the parent can afford another one. You know, children need to have soap to wash every day and shampoo for their hair, toothbrushes and toothpaste. The whole family needs toilet paper. Girls and women need feminine hygiene products. These things are necessities, not luxuries. And so we need to, to talk about this myth of self-sufficiency and try to find ways to let people become self-sufficient while still giving them the things they need. So here, I just can't help myself. This is one more slide on the issue. Is it enough to support a family poverty level? This slide shows you 200% of poverty, right? 47,248 for a family of four with two children. That is 200% of poverty. It's very, very difficult to live in most areas of the country at that level. And you can find out a lot more about that if you look into the self-sufficiency standards. And you have the link there. It's a very interesting um, sort of work, work of research that people have been doing. And they define the income necessary to meet basic needs. And that includes taxes, which is, which is interesting because a lot of um, things that define real costs don't include taxes. Um, and, and, and they can do it by area. And it tells you really how much it costs. And then if you know how much it costs and you know what kind of assistance people have, you know if, in fact, they can meet their needs. And if they can't, why would we not want to provide for those needs? If we know that people are working hard to meet their needs, but the reality of what they have is not enough, we need to go back to that in order to be able to talk to people about why diapers matter. Diapers matter because if a, if a parent has to choose between paying the rent or paying for heat or paying for diapers, they're going to pay for rent or heat because they need to. And then that child is going to be wet and uncomfortable. And that has so many far-reaching effects. And that's why poverty is so integrally involved, why it's so much a part of what we need to be talking about as diaper bankers. 
um, because really current public policy strategy for relieving poverty is, in my opinion, based on a myth, a myth that families can survive on minimum wage. And therefore, anybody who really wants to can break the cycle of poverty. And we know that that's just not true. So one of the areas that um, is really, really interesting, and once, um, once you really start thinking about it, it's um, sort of astounding, which is the reality of, of getting and saving money when you're poor. So this is just, um, you know, the, that's a very bad slide, I apologize. But it's supposed to just be a, a screenshot of a, fr of a front page story at the Washington Post, which is about the high cost of poverty. And what it talks about is that it costs more to be poor than it does to be rich. As a person who has a car and a credit card, I can buy things for considerably less money than somebody who does not have a car and does not have a credit card. Now, why do the car and credit card matter so much? A car can bring you to a different area, and a credit card allows you to buy more. And if we use diapers as an example, and I'm sure everybody on this call knows that the bigger the box of diapers you buy, the less expensive it costs, the, the less expensive it is in real um, dollars. So the diaper itself costs less. But you need to have the $25 to lay out to buy that larger package of diapers. And this is true across the board. If you go into a convenience store or a small store in an inner city, things cost more. And even if you go into a supermarket in a poorer neighborhood, and what the supermarkets will say is there's a cost to doing business in the inner city. You know, you have a higher um, rate of things being taken. You don't have people coming in as often. There are all sorts of reasons they give. But it costs more. So even if you're looking at these numbers of, of how much money people have, it doesn't go as far as it can for somebody who has options. Now, I spent about three days one day recently looking at rent -a centers They're fascinating. But the question is, would you buy a $600 computer knowing it would cost you nearly $1,900 by the time you're done? I mean, the answer is no, right? But people do it all the time. And there are a couple of reasons for it. One is because most rent centers don't ask, don't do credit checks. So you can go in, and if you have enough money for the down payment, you can get the item that you need. And also, there are individuals who feel that this is a good way to save money, so that they might not have access to um, a bank account, and this allows them to save money without having to keep it in their home where it might not be safe. So people buy these things through rent centers If they pay them off, they've usually paid three to four times as much as it would cost if they walked in and bought them at a store with a credit card or with cash. And more often than not, they're not able to pay it off. So, the, so, so they just lose the money. There is no, um, it's not a layaway plan. It's you pay or you don't pay. And if you stop paying, you have to give it back. And so rent-to-centers are, are this other 
place in which it becomes so clear that it is so expensive to be poor. The other place is payday loans, which is an amazing business model. In the 32 states that allow payday loans, 340 to 780 percent annual income. Could you imagine taking out a loan that had a 340 percent interest loan? But that's what we offer the poorest people in our society. So there's an illusion that there is a way for people who don't have a bank account to borrow money. But the reality is that they will lose so much money in using these services. There's lots of research that shows most people who um, use payday loans, if they don't pay them off in the first two-week cycle, can have it balloon to a point that it's so big, they're never able to pay it back. And instead of being able to use a payday loan as a short-term intervention to be able to, um, you know, get on top of your bills, it ends up becoming another area where they are not, um, where they owe money. So a lot of diaper banks use diapers as incentives. I think it's a great idea. It's very interesting though. A lot of people, a lot of funders particularly, don't approve of it. There's this idea that giving poor people something is somehow incentivizing them to do something they wouldn't otherwise do. And that because they're poor, they should want to do what we are suggesting. So it's always fascinating to me. Most people get paid for working. But the idea when um, you have a family where mom is struggling, offering her an incentive to come to a parenting class really shows incredible um, thought on her part that she's able to follow through with it because she knows she needs this for her family. She might not look at what she needs as a mom, but she's looking at what her child needs. But I think it's an interesting idea that so many programs are set up with the idea that in incentivizing is somehow treating people disrespectfully. Um, you know, and I, I think it's a, um, it's a really important thing that we can do, again, as diaper bankers, to be able to talk about what a, an opportunity an incentive is to a family that's struggling. To be able to let them earn what they need is an amazing gift to be able to give. It's not giving somebody something that they don't need, and they're not, you know, getting around people to get it, which is often, I think, what we hear, and I'm sure many of you, you know, hear that on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, which is why why would you just give somebody something? You know, and and why if you just give somebody something, would they ever work? You know, I know that whenever here at NDBN we write anything about diaper need, um, often the response we get is vitriolic. People have such anger towards people who are struggling. 
you know, and this idea that we are creating people, um, we are creating dependency. And what I would say to that is, you know, we're not creating dependency. What we're creating is an opportunity for that parent to be able to take better care of their child so that we really are giving them the chance to be able to take care of their own family. And having those basic needs can allow them to do that. And I think it's really important for diaper banks to have a place in their community to be the voice, to be able to say, you know what? Sometimes you need to give people what they need. You know, um, I sit on lots of councils and committees and commissions, and so often people talk about poverty, but they never ever talk about how they're going to get people out of poverty. You know, education is, you know, a great path out of poverty. But one of the things that I wonder about a lot is when you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know, at the very bottom is, you know, real physiological stuff, um, you know, keeping your body going and whatnot. The, the second level is um, basic needs. I often wonder, well, where would education be? It would be above that. You know, if you can't meet the basic needs for yourself and your family, it's really hard to get to that next level. And I, I believe that people who are working hard to, you know, change the way that education works and to provide all sorts of changes in policy for big picture things are really, really important. But what diaper bankers can do that's different, I think, than anybody is talk about the most basic needs. That, you know, the, the big picture is incredibly important. And we've got to work towards providing everybody, um, you know, the best education possible and all of those good things. But in the interim, we have kids who have been sitting in a diaper all day. And those kids need a clean diaper. And it's not one or the other. It's that diaper bankers can serve a very specific role, which is to always bang the drum, to bang the drum and say, you know what? You might think when I talk about diapers, that it's no big thing and that, you know, a diaper isn't going to be the difference between um, somebody having housing and somebody not having housing. But I know that all of you on this call have stories to tell about how that one diaper or that one pack of diapers was the difference. You know, it's not going to be every day but it does, on a regular basis, impact parents' ability to provide for their children's basic need. It also allows parents to feel like they're providing for their child's basic needs. And that's really, really important as well for a mother to be able to spend time with her child, changing that child's diaper when it needs to happen. Um, you know, anybody here who has spent time with a crying child knows that when it's time to change the baby, it's time to change the baby. You know, and being in a position of not being able to do that has to be a horrible, horrible feeling for that parent. And we can say that. You know, we can tell people who are making these decisions. Um, you know, all this stuff is really important, but it's also really important. You know, when, um, when people get 
um, housed through homeless shelters. You know, a family moves into a new apartment. Who's thinking about providing them sheets and towels, plates and silverware? You know, the things that they need to get started. And certainly, the apartment is incredibly important, and they need that first. But in order to maintain that apartment, they have to be able to meet their basic needs. They have to have the things they need. Um, you know, I think that it gets very easy for people to talk about how, um, you know, people are always looking for a handout. But what we're doing by providing people with their basic needs is really giving them the opportunity to be able to take care of themselves. And that really is sort of the big picture of what I think is so important when it comes to thinking about families and children and poverty. And I hope people have thoughts they'd like to share or questions or comments. I'm going to take everyone I put on mute, off mute, um, so that if you have a question, go ahead and, and ask. Or, or a comment. I know that lots of you guys on this call already serve this purpose in your communities. You, um, you know, do this work, and I'd love to hear more about how you do it, too. Hi, this is Janet. I don't know if someone was trying to talk, but I don't want to interrupt. It no, go, like Janet. No. Oh. Um, thank you. This was really great. And I, I was just going to say that um, oh, I just lost it. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, that it's not for me sometimes what I um, often struggle with and realize that I just need to do more work on is even amongst those who work with families in poverty or work in the low income or early education community, that it's a, a constant reminder to communicate with them the importance of really identifying basic needs and how important they are in the other interventions that they are providing, that it's really a, a message that needs to be reinforced even amongst those like-minded folks. Um, and sometimes it's frustrating to have to continue to do that, but I know that it's work that has to be done, so I'm continually um, um, really bringing that message home with, with folks that I work with. That's a really good point. It doesn't matter how often you say it, you always have to say it again, don't you? Yeah. Joanne, we have a question about asking if you could talk more about incentivizing. Sure, about, about how to do it or about what some of the roadblocks are? Both. Okay, so a lot of diaper banks, including some who are on the phone, use diapers as, you know, offer diapers as an extent as, to be used as incentives to their partner agencies. So for example, a um, nurse home visiting program can use diapers as a way to um, get in the door yeah. Um, a parenting program can use diapers as, um, you know, a, a gift at the end of the session so that, you know, parents are able to accept the services and at the same time get something that they need for their family. You know, when I think about incentives, I think about it really as paying people for what they're doing. So if you're asking parents to take their time and come to a class, even if, if you think that's the greatest class in the world, and, and even if it is, you know, to offer them something for their time, you know, is one way of looking at 
incentives. Um, you know, really being able to um, look at what people need. And so to be able to offer incentives of those things, you know, of things like diapers, hygiene products, clothes, underwear, um, things like that. One of the things we have heard, and we've not been able to find a lot of things actually written about it, but we've heard it anecdotally, is that it is difficult to find money to support incentives for certain things. And so sometimes when writing grants, we have heard that people are told that um, funders do not want to pay for diapers as incentives. So I think that probably has to do with specific grantors and specific communities. But, you know, you can look at and try to frame the idea of incentives differently depending on um, who you're talking to and who you're asking to support you. So that if you know that, for example, a certain group really doesn't believe in incentives, you know, you certainly can do your best to try to help them see how incentives really are a very positive thing, but you also can talk about it differently. You can talk about providing for the needs of the family um, <clears throat> and, and um, you know, in that, in that way. Thanks. No problem. Does anyone have anything to add about incentives? Anybody who uses them, who has, has um, agency partners that uses them? Yes. Go. Some of our agencies use them, just like you said, for budgeting, uh, classes for budgeting, parenting. The hard thing about that, using them as incentives, is that these people cannot get there um, or their, the time that they have to be there is difficult as well as sometimes they're not allowed to bring their child, so they also need a babysitter. Right. So that's, it's, it's a very interesting thing, and that is, that is an, an incredible example of where if you're at the table, you can sometimes bring up these things. You know, so diapers are what diaper banks do, but when you talk about basic needs, you talk about really the things people need to do things. So if you're offering a class for parents that doesn't provide childcare, you yeah. know, you're, you, it's hard. It's really hard to, to get, um, you know, what are you going to do with your kid? Right. Um, and, and we can, as diaper bankers, that's part of what really, um, you know, we're able to talk about is that very, that idea that, um, you know, you've got to think about the little things, that the big things are really important, but if you don't think about the little things, it can be hard to um, take care of those bigger things. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. Oh, good. Um, oh, thank you, Wendy, that's very nice. Um, so do other people have thoughts, comments? Now, I will say that, um, you know, as I mentioned before, the National Center for Children in Poverty out of um, Columbia University is an incredibly useful tool for people. Um, they have great one-sheeters that really, um, you know, explain a lot about sort of what a family looks like from the um, perspective of, um, you know, numbers, and, and it's very useful because it can be looked at in a state or, um, you know, state, state by state or federally. Um, and there's also lots of information about toxic stress um, through the um, Harvard Center on the, I think it's the emerging child, but we can, we can send it out. But it really is useful when you talk about poverty to be able to talk about why it matters. And why does it matter? Because 
it is as impactful on a child's development as so many other things that we all know are really problematic, you know, like uh, multiple moves or domestic violence or parental substance use. And, and poverty is in there um, as, as that same type of risk factor. Um, and while we're trying to ameliorate all those other problems, poverty is something we actually, some aspects of it can actually be addressed with money. You know, <laughs> we know how much it costs to give people diapers and we can do it. You know, we know how much it costs to provide soap and shampoo and there's no reason we can't do it. And, and I think that, that is what we can really talk to people about that is so important is Yes, there are problems that are so big that we can't do, but there are some problems that aren't so big, and and we could try to address them. Sorry, I get all excited and I can't stop myself. Um, you know, we do have a couple more minutes left. If anybody has anything they want to add, any points. Well, if people think of other things um, that they'd like to talk about or that they'd like to see us add when we talk about poverty um, in relation to diaper need, um, that would be very, very good for us to hear about, to, to know um, what, what resonated with you and what, did, what didn't, um, and if there's a way we can um, make it work better for you guys, or if there are things that you think we should try to make sure we get out to everybody, information that you think it would really be useful for people to have that you should that, that we should make sure to um, to get out there. Thank you, Joanne, and thank you all for joining us. Uh, we'll, we, we will we uh, will we have recorded the session, and we will be putting up on the website. And um, thank you again um, uh, for joining us and. Uh, Thanks for holding on uh, and joining us despite the fact of uh, despite the week delay with the, um, the snow. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye bye.